Uh, we should uh, start again. Uh, the, the speaker, Irving Levenau, cannot introduce himself, so I have to do the introduction as uh, having been the uh, moderator of the morning section, but Irving does not want an introduction, and I wouldn't like one either. Uh, I hope uh, I would like to make instead a scherzo, and I hope it comes better than my first one. Um, not many people know how much I and the uh, Art Historical Institute in Hamburg uh, owe to uh, Irving Levin. To mention just uh, one point, never could the House of the Warburg Library, uh, the, the House of the Warburg Library, the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek, um, uh, been given back to the to academic life if not Irving uh, would have intervened in a certain moment, which surely he and me will never forget, to say the least. So I wanted to bring some uh, flowers from Hamburg, but uh, I bring now some from uh, Berlin. Um, and could I have the, the in, in, in the shape of, of, of slides? Uh, yeah. So when you walk, when you walk uh, from the Humboldt University towards here, it might could have been uh, seen towards the Brandenburg Gate, shimmering here through the through the trees, the new building of uh, Frank uh, 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 Gary. Then you ap approach the Friedrichstraße, here the Berlin Beer. Um, and uh, here right on the corner of the Unter den Linden and the Friedrichstraße, something strange happens. The next, please. <coughs> so um, one is this column here. So it has a certain attraction because here there is a Rolls-Royce uh, shop. <laughs> Fantastic uh, Rolls-Royce uh, shop, yeah. So one, uh, of course, attracted um, continues. <coughs> Please, the next. <coughs> Goes now, is confronted with this kind of darkness and uh, here with this uh, monumental pier. And the next. <coughs> so there is life going on here. You see the uh, cars here. You see shimmering part of one Rolls Royce. The next, please. And you see how many people look into this uh, vitrine over there. And this is now uh, the gift. The next, please. <coughs> this is for Gerda Panofsky. <laughs> for uh, <coughs> uh, Irving, you see, Erwin Panofsky, the ideologischen uh, Vorläufer des Rolls Royce Kühlers and the, his famous uh, articles uh, about film from 1936, the German edition with the uh, um, uh, uh, famous uh, uh, Victoria as a symbol on the, uh, on the uh, um, front uh, of the uh, radiator of the Rolls Royce about which Panofsky wrote one of his most inspired uh, books in which uh, uh, Irving uh, introduced with a congenial introduction. And it might be not the worst sign that on the corner of the Friedrichstraße in Unter den Linden, permanently Irving Panofsky and Irving Levin are present. Uh, Horst, you're going to be sorry you did that. <laughs> Will you please go back? Wait, don't go away. Go back to the first slide. <laughs> I have two things to say in response to that. The very first one that he showed, I think it was the first, I hope. No, keep going. Yeah. I think it's let's say, indicative that what he talked about was the Rolls Royce. What's really interesting about that photograph is the bee, because what, that, what is happening is that Volkswagen is reviving the Bugatti. Those of you who know what a Bugatti is, <laughs> that's what that is, a prototype of the greatest of all Italian cars, which Volkswagen is now reviving 
uh, to be, I think, probably by far the most expensive car on the market, way beyond the Rolls Royce. It's supposed to have 22 cylinders or something like that. <laughs> and inside, over on the other side, is the prototype of this uh, world-class Italian, Italian car. The other thing I wanted to say is uh, how much I appreciate uh, your remarks about the, the Warburg Institute at, uh, at Hamburg because I think um, people who think that the Warburg Institute moved to London are wrong. I think the Warburg Institute moved to Princeton. Panofsky represents much more of the Warburg Institute than anyone else. One of the problems, oh, I should say that um, a few days ago, a very few days ago, we had a note from Enrico Castelnuovo that he was not coming and that he had no paper for us to deliver for him here. I had to improvise, and I decided to improvise in a sort of a special way by contributing a sketch of my own in the form of a paper that I gave on the subject that led me to this conference uh, nearly 50 years ago. It was a sketch, and you're going to hear it verbatim, it was a sketch then, and it remains a sketch in the sense that it was never brought to any sort of completion, except in some special way, uh, these events in these days. First slide on the left. Hmm? Sorry? Okay. No slidey, no talking. <laughs> First slide on the left. No, you have to go all the way back to the beginning there. I don't know how that happened. That's the one I want on the left. The other side is dark. The right, your, your right side is dark. That's it. Good. All right, lights. <laughs> Can you hear me now? All right. One of the problems that has most preoccupied historians of Italian Renaissance art during recent years concerns the amount and kind of preparation that lay behind the great mural decorations of the Trecento of the 14th century the great age that followed upon Giotto. Following the basic work of Robert Ertel, published in 1940, and especially since the discovery of Sinopias, the monumental and often astonishingly sketchy drawings executed directly on the wall in full scale to, pro to guide the artist as he covered them over with wet plaster on which he painted the fresco itself, Many of these were rediscovered after the war when churches in Italy were destroyed and they were repaired and fre the frescoes were taken off the wall and underneath them they found this glorious uh, uh, cache of, of drawings by the, painters, uh, by the painters of that period. They are, as you see, this one uh, by uh, Paris Spinello, uh, astonishingly sketchy and they are full scale and they were made to be covered over as the artist then covered them with fresco on which he painted. So they're sketchy, but they're not sketches. The artist covered them over. They were guidelines for him. But especially since this discovery, the old view that the medieval painter worked by a more or less mechanical method of copying from prescribed prototypes and patterns can no longer be maintained. Indeed, the chief controversy has been reduced to the question whether even small-scale compositional sketches were used. There has been a fundamental reversal in our view of how works of art were conceived. The medieval painter, formerly thought of as bound by an ironclad system of servile copying, now emerges as the paragon of direct and unpremeditated creation. It was the Renaissance that sought to objectify and rationalize the artistic process into a fixed body of rules. The problem has its counterpart in sculpture, though it has received far less 
discussion in this domain. It's still true. And it is in this context that I shall offer some rather loosely connected and tentative remarks on the history of the use of bozzetti and modelli and sculptural procedure in general. A useful point of departure was provided in 1927, the next two, by a pioneering study by Karl Blumel on Greek sculptural technique. On certain pieces, unfinished pieces of ancient statuary, there is preserved a number of small protuberances or knobs with tiny holes in the center. Uh, I hope you can see down here, down here, up on the head, there are these little knobs with little holes in the center, and here they are, here they are here, and here they are here. A number of these are preserved. And by analogy with modern sculptural practice, it is evident that these knobs are what are called points, fixed reference marks by means of which measurements are made in copying from a model or another sculpture. The next on the left. A modern example of this, it's essentially a, prin a principle, a mechanical method of triangulation giving you the point in depth. Such examples prove beyond question that a system of mechanical pointing off was known and used in antiquity. On this basis, Blumel made a fundamental observation concerning an inherent difference in procedure between sculpture that is executed free and directly in the stone and sculpture produced by pointing off from a model, the next on the left. In the former case, characteristic of archaic and classical Greece, the artist tends to carve the statue uniformly in the round. He removes, as it were, a series of skins from the figure, which at any given stage in the execution will show a more or less uniform degree of finish. We have many examples. With the technique of pointing off, used particularly by the Romans, and these were Roman sculptures you were looking at, for copying, for, for copying Greek statuary, the tendency is to work the figure from one side at a time and to bring some start parts to a state of relative completion before others. That is characteristic of these, which you've seen, and of all examples preserved of this kind. These questions are largely unexplored as regards medieval sculpture. What little evidence there is comes mainly from the Gothic period. But though limited, the evidence is of great value because it speaks with a single and unequivocal voice, the next on the right. Blumel himself cited several unfinished examples, such as a small allegory of fortitude from the late 14th century in Orvieto. The technique is basically similar to that of archaic Greek sculpture. Indeed, all the medieval examples show the characteristics of direct carving without pointing from a model. Even more striking is the consistency of the documentary evidence, which for the late 14th and early 15th century, particularly in Italy, is rather extensive, with abundant records for both Florence and Milan cathedrals. And they show that, without exception, the monumental sculptures of these buildings were executed not from models, but from drawings. The drawings, moreover, were not provided by the executing sculptors, but by other artists, usually painters. The evidence concords perfectly with what the preserved examples suggested. For sculpture executed exclusively from drawings is of necessity carved directly. This then was the system under which the great masters of the early Renaissance grew up. And it is astonishing how rapidly and completely things changed. We cannot even remotely conceive of Ghiberti or Donatello or Luca della Robbia executing sculpture as a general practice after someone else's drawings, let alone a painter's. And as the sculptor began to provide his own designs, the documents show with equal consistency that these designs now normally took the form of sculptured models. Drawings continued to be used, of course, but they were no longer the distinctive basis upon which works were commissioned or appraised. 
And with the use of models came the use of enlargement techniques, at first tentatively, then with greater assurance. The next on the left. The first instance of a mechanical pointing method came only at the turn, at the end, toward the end of the 15th century. This was Leonardo's ingenious perforated box shown in a drawing of about 1492. Leonardo's device, it must be admitted, is very crude. It would not allow for more than a relatively small number of points to be taken. It would be cumbersome for work on a large scale and would not be well suited for enlargements or reductions. If Leonardo's invention was, as usual, at the vanguard of its time, we must conclude that pointing techniques were being experimented with but were not very highly developed by the end of the Quattrocento. A watershed in this history is represented by a famous giant, gigante, is the term used in the official records. Commissioned from Agostino di Duccio in 1464 to be placed high up on the buttresses of Florence Cathedral. Agostino contracted to execute the enormous figure, some 20 feet high, based on a model in wax. If Agostino has, had succeeded, this would have been the first colossal freestanding marble statue since antiquity. Moreover, in further emulation of the fabled masters of the antiquity, he intended to carve the finger from a single block, rather than piecing it together out of several. The administrators of the cathedral agreed to pay Agostino an extraordinary fee, not only for the great spendio et expensa, but also for the greater intelletto required for this extraordinary feat. Imagine a corporate sponsor today paying extra for a work of art because it took more brains. <laughs> but Agostino did not succeed. Fortunately for us, maybe, as it turned out. Owing, no doubt, to some calculation in his pointing system, Agostino was forced to give up and leave the block male abuzzatum, badly roughed out. I speak here of a pointing system because of what happened next, nearly 40 years later, the next two. The phrase, male abotsatum, occurs in a record of 1501, in which the overseers of the cathedral ceded this huge block to Michelangelo, who would, in the next two years, carve from it his famous David, no less. If the hypothesis about Agostino's abortive attempt at pointing off his giant is correct, perhaps we can shed some light on another part of the same document, which is by all odds one of the most curious notices in the whole history of Renaissance sculpture. In the margin, next to the main text giving the block to Michelangelo, the following note was added. The said Michelangelo began to work on the said giant on the morning of 13 September 1501. Although a few days earlier, on 9 September, he had, with one or two blows of the chisel, uno vel duo ictibus, removed a certain node, quod dam nodum, that it had on its chest. This nodus has been interpreted as a knot of drapery, on the assumption, perfectly okay, that Agostino's figure was to be clothed. Michelangelo's ain't. I wonder, however, if the notice was not, in fact, a point. A knob of marble deliberately retained by Agostino as a fixed reference for measuring off his colossal from the model. The David is one of the vivid cases of Michelangelo's phobia against people seeing his work while in progress. 
he actually had a wall built around it to keep away the curious. Yet, the payments show that Michelangelo had removed the notice before the wall was built, while the block was still visible. He seems to have wanted one and all to know that he intended to execute the statue without Agostino's notice. We can scarcely even speculate as to how Michelangelo himself accomplished the feat. We know from Vasari that he too made a wax model. That he used a system of enlargement is suggested by the very fact that he built a wall around the figure, which would have made it practically impossible to judge the proportions from a distance. Another tantalizing notice is that he, left, he also left portions of the original block which might have served as stationary references for a measuring system at the head and the base of the figure, exactly where they would normally be uh, in that technique. They were removed in the 18th century. In any event, the David is the first definite instance we have of Michelangelo's use of the model in preparation for monumental sculpture. Thereafter, in his work, the model takes on a virtually unheralded significance. The next two. Michelangelo's small figures in wax and clay, hand size more or less, have the quality and directness that prompts us to speak for the first time of real sculptural sketches or bozzetti as they're called. In the terracotta car torso in the British Museum on the left, we even find the very same personal graphic surface treatment that appears in the unfinished marbles and in many of his drawings. Throughout the whole prior history of European sculpture, there is nothing that conveys in this way the feeling of being confronted with the artist's most inward and private searchings. At the opposite extreme stands the equally dramatic fact that with Michelangelo, we are able for the first time since antiquity again to prove the use of large scale models for monumental stone sculpture. I refer, of course, to the Medici tombs. Large models for the figures sculptures are amply documented in Michelangelo's own diary, the next on the right, and one, the famous river god, quite a large figure, in the Academia is still preserved. Both these innovations are relevant to still another extraordinary aspect of Michelangelo's working procedure, the next on the right. This is his habit described by Vasari and Cellini and confirmed by the works themselves of attacking the block from one side only, uncovering the projected forms first and proceeding only gradually to the deeper excavations. The significance of this technique has not, I think, been clearly grasped, though Vasari himself supplies the explanation. Its purpose was to avoid errors by leaving room at the back of the block for alterations. In other words, should the artist encounter any flaws in the marble as the work proceeds, should he make a mistake, should he alter his conception, all of which happened to Michelangelo, he will be in a much better position to make any necessary allowances or changes than if the opposite side were already hewn away. We hear clearly here an echo of the later classical procedure that Blumel showed was based on making ma copies by pointing off. Michelangelo's technique, too, developed in relation to his use of models. Indeed, Vasari gives his description of Michelangelo's procedure in a passage in his treatise dealing with the use of models. His description is even couched in the famous analogy of a wax model slowly withdrawn from a pail of water. I do not mean to imply that Michelangelo actually pointed off in a modern way, as has been claimed, or even that he necessarily made models on whatever scale in every case. Rather, I suggest in general terms that these two most salient features of his working procedure, his one-sided approach to the block and the unprecedented role of Bozzetti and Modelli in his work, should be viewed as interconnected phenomena 
one proceeding directly from the other. To judge from the history of the creative process in sculpture, spontaneity and calculation arose together, hand in hand, mostly the hands of Michelangelo. Much of what we have said so far about the creative process comes inadvertently, as it were, from documents and sources concerning specific works and projects. In the course of the 16th century, a radical development took place from which it might be said that this very conference of ours arose. The creative process became self-conscious and articulate, virtually and autonomous, the next on the right. You see it here already in the tomb executed somewhat after Michelangelo's death, the tomb of Michelangelo, where the very personification of sculpture displays a small sketch model as her attribute. Benvenuto Cellini and Vasari wrote elaborate treatises on sculptural procedure, nothing like it before, detailing a series of clearly defined steps from small study through the full-scale model to the final work. Very clear, very systematic. They both give as much attention to the preparatory stages, the making of the models, as to the final execution. This attitude has its visual corollary in the fact that the preliminary studies, the next two please, and models now become independent and highly finished works of art in their own right. It is no accident that two of Giambologna's full-scale models, the Rape of the Sabines and the Florence Triumphant over Pisa, were carefully preserved along with the executed works. You see them both in the case of the, uh, in the, case of, uh, of the Florence uh, Triumph, and this is a, a, a small-scale model, um, small model for it. And of course, the studies for works of art in a large scale were themselves often cast in bronze as what we now call, next please, Kleinkunst. This, for example, is a wonderful uh, such uh, model by Giovanni Bologna himself, which was a model for a great huge fountain in Bologna. Go see it, it's marvelous. And here we have uh, one of his models that was cast in bronze and treated as a final work of art. The next on the right, I think you've gotten a little ahead of me, the next on the right, that's fine. This by no means signifies that true bozzetti were not produced in the 16th century. Although the highly finished studies form the backbone of Giambologna's preparatory method, under certain what I would call iconographical circumstances at least, he produced sketches that go far beyond Michelangelo in freedom of handling. I'm showing you one of these astonishing little sketches uh, in sculpture by John Bologna, which has all the rough surface that we talk about, but be careful, it's made for that gigantic figure. It's colossal. You can have tea in its head representing the Apennines, so the roughness of the sketch goes with the roughness of the final work of art. It's not rough. We have no rough sketches of that kind for his other kinds of sculpture. A generation later, Bernini certainly derived his bozzetto style from such sketches by Giambologna, possibly in the Medici collection in Florence. But Bernini continued and even surpassed the late 16th century in working out his conception fully in advance, the next two. The contemporary critic Joachim von Sondracht, who visited Bernini's studio, reports he saw no less than 22 wax bozzetti for the colossal figure of St. Longinus in St. Peter's, which you see on the left. You can't quite have tea in its head, but it's almost that big. This figure, which is in the Fog Museum, is about so high. Sandrart was astonished and observed that the number of studies was far greater than other sculptors were wont to produce. This one, by the way, is not wax, it's terracotta. Well, there were more. The next two. 
11 bozzetti are, pres are still preserved today for his ethereal, cloud-borne, and wind-blown angels carrying the instruments of the Passion fleetingly alighted on the Ponte Sant'Angelo across the Tiber in Rome. And in them, we follow the development of Bernini's ideas with a degree of intimacy that can only be described as startling. In his use of smaller models, Bernini reversed the relationship between Bozzetti and developed studies as compared with Giambologna, the next on the right. Loose and very personal sketches, instead of being relatively rare, were his characteristic instrument of creation and comprised by far the greater proportion of the corpus of his known terracottas. No less clear is the evidence for Bernini's commitment to the full-scale model, the next two. In every case where the documents for his larger commissions are preserved, they show, without exception, that he used full-scale models. It was through them that he was able to control and give his personal stamp to vast undertakings executed largely with the help of assistants. He also used them, as we know, to see what they looked like on that scale. Uh, you have an example here. The model that you're seeing on your right is actually in itself way larger than a human being. It's a study model for the figures of the angels way up there uh, on the chair of St. Peter's. We're now talking about modeling on an absolutely unheard of scale. A corollary symptom of this comprehensive mode of creation is the fact that, Bernini and his, that with Bernini and his school, we begin to get measured Bozzetti. That is, the next on the right, Bozzetti on which calibrated scales have been incised for the purpose of mathematically precise enlargement. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, guess, I, I guess I should have said the left side. Go back. That's off. Yeah, right. You can leave it. What happened? Did something go past? Where do we want to go? Forward on the left. No, that's going to get us back to, no, go on one more. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. The first example of a measured bozzetto I know, in fact, is a magnificent little sketch by Bernini in the Hermitage for the angel with the inscription on the bridge, where measured scales run vertically up both sides of the rear support. A small step for man, perhaps, but a large one for mankind. I do not believe one could duplicate this kind of advanced preparation in the work of any previous sculptor. We are faced with the remarkable paradox that behind Bernini's revolutionary effects of freedom and spontaneity, there lay an equally, equally unprecedented degree of conscious premeditation. In a sense, it might be said that Bernini simply carried to a new level the tendency to externalize and articulate the creative process that had begun in the early Renaissance. But there was, I think, a more specific motivation, a deliberate effort to retain or deliberately to increase the sense of immediacy and freshness. These qualities, previously incidental byproducts of the creative process, became part of its very purpose a goal toward which Bernini's elaborate preparations were aimed. In this way, one can also understand the vast gulf separating Bernini's conception of sculpture from that of Michelangelo, despite the many points they have in common. For Michelangelo, sculpture was a matter of taking away material to reveal the form in the stone. And he was obsessed with the difficulties of the task. Such phrases as dura and alpestra, pietra, hard and alpine stone occur repeatedly in his poems in reference to sculpture. Make no mistake, sculpture was not an easy business for Bernini either. The degree of preparation in itself bears witness, and one of Michelangelo's own dicta that he applied to himself was, Nelemia opere caco sangue, 
In my work I shit blood. But whereas Michelangelo's straining and struggling figures often really look that way, for Bernini a major challenge was to preserve in the final execution the momentary inspiration of a sketch. Hence he thought of sculpture as a process of molding the marble rather than hewing it away. And he said precisely that one of his greatest achievements was to have succeeded in, succeeded in rendering the marble pieghevole come la cera, pliable as wax. Rodin expressed exactly this attitude in his portrayal of the hand of God. Emulating Michelangelo, deliberately subverting the distinction between rough, cold, hard, stone, and smooth, warm, soft flesh, his hand was guided by the hand of Bernini. Many thanks for listening.